I have to say, I did not expect this. You know, this is the end of the conference, after lunch. What are you all doing? <laughs> but amazing. Um, looks like you're interested in governance, DBT, and maybe data contracts. So let's do a quick show of hands. How many here are aware of DBT? <laughs> Good. We, we need to do funnel analytics, right? So step one is the bottom of the funnel, right? Or the top of the funnel, sorry. Top of the funnel. DBT. Everyone knows DBT. Great. Second question. How many of you know about Data Hub? All right. Quite a few. Quite a few. More than I had expected, because there's no Data Hub in the talk title. Um, third question. How many of you are familiar with data contracts? Ah, more people. Good, good. So I did a version of this talk at Airflow Summit earlier, and the funnel was actually, first everyone knew about Airflow, and then many people knew about Data Hub, and then a few people knew about data contracts. Here it's actually different. Of course, everyone knows about DBT, more people know about data contracts, and less people know about Data Hub. Interesting. So I'm Shashanka. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Acryl Data. And um, today I'll be talking about shifting left on your governance initiatives and how you can do that with DBT or not, um, and how data contracts help you uh, get there. Who am I? Let's see. Um, so prior to Acryl, I was at LinkedIn for uh, 10 plus years where I was responsible for a few different things. Primarily, I was a technical lead for the data platform team. And you know, data platform teams are really understaffed and overstressed and overburdened with a lot of requests. And so that was me. Uh, and a lot of things that I had to do early on in my career at LinkedIn was uh, making data easy to use. So data democracy was our rallying cry. We had data analysts and machine learning engineers and data scientists. And we had to make sure that they were able to use data very quickly on their first day of, at the job or in the, within the first week because LinkedIn was a very data-driven company and continues to be very data-driven. But as the company matured, and as my job responsibilities grew, it became clear to me that it was not just important to use all the data that we had, but also to use it responsibly and to make sure that we were actually compliant with all of the regulatory um, things that we were uh, promising our members that we were going to be doing for them and how we were keeping their data safe. So I was actually the GDPR tech lead for LinkedIn as well. And that led to kind of reimagining, in fact, what we were doing with data democracy for data governance and privacy. Uh, and a lot of that learning actually led to the creation of the Data Hub project. So I was part of the, you know, the initial team that uh, founded the Data Hub project. Uh, and the main um, learning from that uh, project, it went over, I would say, six years uh, from 2013 all the way to now was that uh, data is not easy and metadata is even harder. So with that, we'll talk about uh, Acryl, which is the commercial version of Data Hub, but also um, blend in features that Data Hub, the open source project, has as we go. But let's start with the big problem. Um, you know, old school data governance uh, is broken. Uh, how many here were part of the data space, say, 10 years ago? Well, so, so then you guys and gals know <clears throat> how old school data governance used to be done. Because everyone since then actually doesn't know how it was done, because we never did it. We actually just wrote a lot of SQL and then made reports happen and made insights happen. And we said governance, someone else's problem. And the reason um, that has happened is because in the way past, data governance actually used to be easy, because there was a very waterfall model and a very monolithic model in which we were doing data. You know, business would request a new product, and then there would be a consultation, and then something would get built, and then there would be sign-offs and reviews, and then finally something would get built and shipped. But that's not today, right? Um, 2012, th if this looks fragmented, wait until you see 2023. This is what it looked like in 2012. I was uh, in the center of it all, you know, LinkedIn was, adopting Hadoop and doing a bunch of things, and there were a lot of companies uh, that I was speaking to that were building interesting technologies around Hadoop. And this is what it looks like in 2023. And this is what we all have done. <laughs> this is what we've done to data. Data itself, 
has gotten fragmented and we have innovated and built so much. Um, and that's, that's our modern data stack, right? <laughs> and so pretty much I think if I interview every one of you, you will find that each one of you has maybe a hint of dbt in your stack, but there's probably a lot of other systems uh, that you're assembling to create your own um, a la carte data stack, and that leads to a lot of problems, right? Uh, some things obviously got easier. Uh, data storage, data movement, a bunch of these things got easier. Innovation happened, and now for each one of these problems, we have one, two, or three tools that are best in class and are you know, constantly evolving, and so we get an advantage of really picking the best of breed in each of these segments. But what got harder was, you know, we split apart data operations, you know, the creation of data and the consumption of data with data governance. And we kept them even further apart. Uh, you probably don't even know who your governance team is, uh, but they probably exist and they're probably right now in some tool or in some Excel sheet trying to document some asset. Uh, that asset probably doesn't exist anymore but they're still documenting it and keeping it up to date. Um, and that's what we have <laughs> done as an industry. And so, you know, these two teams, they work separately, they have their own OKRs and KPIs, uh, but they're kind of working in opposite uh, direction to each other in some ways, or kind of isolated from each other. And that's because, you know, we, we create products very quickly. We, we an estimate start to finish of a new insight, a new uh, asset is, you know, less than two weeks. Why should something take less more than a sprint, right? That's the question we ask. Uh, but on the other hand, governance and all of these things are usually left off to do later and perhaps never. Um, my favorite question at the booth, we have a booth and I keep asking people, so how are, do, how are you doing data? My favorite question is, uh, are you writing DBT tests? And most people have a little smirk and they try to walk away. <laughs> Because I think very few people, everyone wants to write them, but I think very few people actually end up doing it. So as a result, you know, these things usually never happen. And on top of that, this velocity has uh, eliminated shared context around data. So as a producer of data, I know exactly how I'm producing it, how I'm creating it, but I sometimes don't know why. Uh, someone told me I need to do it, so I just create something. I probably know how to write the SQL well but I lack business knowledge. I don't understand why I'm doing what I'm doing, what real outcomes it's driving. Data consumers, on the other hand, are quite the opposite, right? They could actually describe the business context, but they don't actually have a way to place that context in a development pathway. So you're authoring your DBT model or your uh, Airflow job or you know, your Spark uh, job, but you don't have a way of a business user actually describing why they need this and injecting it into your development pathway. And so these two teams just, again, continue to be somewhat isolated. They're all busy, everyone's working hard, but all of that work doesn't get consolidated into one place. So how do we solve this? I mean, obviously there is uh, one solution, slow down. Uh, we could slow down data production, really follow waterfall slow down data consumption, don't ask for stuff every day, wait. Um, or we could kind of just accept the new normal that things are always gonna be broken all the time and we'll just be 80% good. Um, I think all of these are false uh, outcomes, but I think most of us are <laughs> somewhere here, right? Uh, a mix of that. And sometimes uh, organizations I see go from move fast and break things to oh no, everything has to be signed off before anything ships. And we realize that both of these outcomes are at spectrums that we actually don't, two ends of the spectrum that we don't want. So our approach is that uh, just like how we apply CI, CD to you know, software engineering, we should be applying the same principles to data governance, which means it should be continuous, not an after the fact activity, it should be federated, meaning it should actually live close to where data production happens. And then finally, it should be driven by central standards because distributed teams have no idea what good looks like at an aggregate level. Central teams do, but they need the tools to translate those central concerns or desires into distributed teams that are you know, working on distributed decoupled data development, also known as data mesh or DBT mesh or something mesh. But essentially, decoupled data development, everyone gets behind that. Um, but it has to be driven by central standards because 
Governance is all about defining what looks good across different systems. So how do we do this? How do we actually do modern data governance? Um, Acryl thinks it has solved the problem, and this is our vision. Uh, we think about data, the data plane as being composed of everything that you're assembling in your data stack. So that's you know, DBT, Airflow, GitHub, Snowflake, BigQuery, Great Expectations, you, know, you name it. There's like a bazillion tools that you could be using. Each of those tools has an enormous amount of useful and important metadata that they are consuming as well as producing all the time. And what Acryl, the Acryl control plane, which is powered by Data Hub, which is the open source project, does is it's continuously listening for changes happening to these systems. And you could either be pulling metadata out of these systems or pushing metadata from these systems. So it could be something as simple as a schema that's getting checked in to Git, or a DBT model that you're checking in or evolving, or it could be an Airflow job that just is running, or a Spark job that just ran, or a streaming SQL job that's continuously running. All of these systems are either producing data continuously, metadata continuously, or getting metadata pulled from them continuously. And all this metadata gets pulled into the central metadata graph that's driven by Data Hub. And since it's a streaming platform, you can continuously react to the changes that are happening. So it's not just a data discovery application where, of course, humans can come in and look at the lineage and understand how things are getting transformed, but it's actually a living technical metadata graph, which means you can actually take automated actions on it right away. So even as I was speaking, a DBT job probably ran, and maybe data was produced, and maybe the quality is good, or maybe it's bad. You could actually have a downstream job get kicked off or not, depending on how the quality results look, by just subscribing to the events that are coming out of the metadata plane. Um, you could detect the fact that a schema changed in a backwards incompatible manner. You could detect the fact that a column drifted in a strange way. Or you could detect the fact that a classification result has arrived for a column that detected that this particular column probably has PII. And so you now you need to go and lock down access uh, to the downstream table. All of those automations are now available for you to build. And that's what we believe uh, a control plane should do. It should essentially give you a unified view across all of your data sources so, so that even your, uh, your humans as well as your programs can actually take automated actions. And so we think of it as you know, these three steps, establishing context, maintaining context, and then acting on it. Uh, the maintain part is kind of important because the technical metadata that's coming out of these data sources is truth, but it has not yet been harmonized. You might have documentation coming in from DBT, you might have some documentation coming in from Snowflake, but you might actually want to refine it one more time before agreeing that this is indeed the final value that you want to assign to this particular asset. So there's a continuous monitoring and refinement loop um, that the control plane actually enables. So let's look at what that looks like. And uh, first off, we'll just uh, talk about what we're really talking about at a high level. Just like DBT introduced software engineering principles to analytics, we'll talk about how those same principles can actually be used for modern data governance. Uh, so I've talked about the discovery experience a little bit. So let's look at what uh, DBT actually looks like in Acro or in Data Hub. Uh, the homepage looks like a standard you know, search box. You can go in and look at uh, all of your domains that have been automatically set up, or you can explore your data. As you can see, it, it, it's not just data sets, but also dashboards, charts, ML models, feature tables, pipelines, or your business glossary, everything is available. Uh, and then, of course, you can just search. So let's say I'm an analyst who just joined, and I, someone told me to build the pet adoption rate metric, and I have no idea what that is, and I just got to this homepage, I'll probably just type in pet adoptions or something and see what comes back. And that's what most people do. They search for stuff, and then they find useful information. In this case, this is what the search page looks like. You get back useful contextual results. You can slice and dice by different aspects. And that allows you to get to the thing that you are trying to get to, which is usually an asset that you are trying to use to build your next analysis. The individual entity page also has a lot more details. So you can look at column level stats. You can look at how the schema has changed over time. You can look at who the owners are. 
uh, and further details like that. In the case of DBT, since DBT and Snowflake or whatever your relational warehouses are kind of peers to each other, so there'll be a DBT model and then there'll be a table that backs it, we actually have a composite view of that, so you can actually see it's a DBT table backed by a Snowflake table, and so you can get kind of that 360 degree view across both systems. So you can see the DBT query, but then you can also see the Snowflake table statistics, uh, as well as the audit history and other queries that have run against it. And then finally, uh, this is something we do really well with DBT, is that in your schema YAML uh, file, when you write additional metadata, like um, you know, some people use the meta tags quite heavily, uh, and they've come up with their own definitions of what good looks like. Like some organization will put owners in there, some organizations even have freeform tags that they put in there. You can actually integrate that with Acryl quite nicely by saying all of these things go into these first class entities. So documentation goes here, ownership goes there, and tags get uh, minted automatically when you ingest. So there's no going back to the catalog and rewriting the same things. Your developers can actually author stuff in DBT directly, and they get instantly translated into native artifacts uh, in the metadata platform. Uh, we also integrate with DBT tests, so you can actually see how your tests run over time. Whether all assertions are passing or not, we give a nice green checkbox at the very top if everything is looking good. And you can also look back over time. And that can be very useful to identify if an asset is actually trustworthy or not, depending on whether tests have actually been working for that asset or not. And we talked about how people don't write tests, and I'll get to, get to that uh, later. The other thing that we do also is um, GitHub Actions themselves. So when you have uh, a DBT model that has changed, uh, we actually comment back on that PR and say, well, you changed this model. Here are the number of downstream entities that you've impacted. And three of them are actually business critical dashboards. And we think that you should actually make sure to check if the change you made is actually safe. Uh, and as you, can, as you can imagine, this is very useful because the DBT developer often doesn't know what all downstreams they're impacting all the way to a business dashboard when they make a small change to a, a DBT model. And this you know, requires them to not know about Data Hub or Acryl at all because they're just in DBT and they're able to get all of this additional context right where they live, which is something that we believe a lot in. That's why we call this shift left, where you're shifting left practices that usually were happening after the fact in line with creating data itself. And when you do things like that, good things happen. So you end up getting end-to-end -end column level lineage all the way from your airflow tasks to your DBT models all the way to your Looker or Tableau or Power BI dashboards. And so you can actually look from either from left to right, I'm gonna change this column, who all am I impacting and how, or on the other side, I'm a business user, I'm just looking at a particular dashboard. How is it built? And if this particular metric is, which particular column is it being sourced from? All of those things become very easy to do when you have something like this that's just automated and always on. Um, and for cases where you're not using DBT, uh, let's say you're using Airflow, you can also supplement the lineage with column level lineage from Airflow as well. So it really scales beyond just one walled garden. And that's, I think, the, the biggest strength with this platform is that you don't have to be all in on system A or system B or system C because the reality is we are always migrating. We're always moving from technology A to technology B. Um, this system can actually be that harmonizing layer that connects everything together. So all of this was really the discovery experience that you get once you connect uh, Acryl up to uh, DBT and your, the rest of your data stack. Let's talk really quick about the governance experience. Um, on top of that metadata graph that I showed you, Acryl basically gives you a test framework that you can write yourself. Uh, metadata tests are essentially uh, configurable workflows that you can define that are continuously running and evaluating conditions on the metadata graph. So perhaps you as a central team want certain things to be true. Maybe you want data sets produced by a certain team to always be high quality. Or maybe you want data sets that have high usage at your organization to be always marked as a tier one data asset. Uh, or maybe you want to look at query percentiles and usage percentiles and based on that determine which data sets should be deprecated and not be used anymore. 
Uh, with this automation framework, you can actually write all of those things and take action on them automatically. So the Acryl engine essentially continuously runs these tests against the metadata as it's changing, and, it, and you can set automations that include things like sending Slack alerts, or marking this thing deprecated, or um, sending an email alert that something should be uh, retired, or even driving a downstream uh, action that could actually go and delete that data asset if you want to. So this allows you to essentially have this continuous feedback loop where you're not only looking at stuff, but actually able to act on it in a central way. Uh, in addition to that, you can do things like tag propagation. So if you've got a tag in DBT or a tag in Data Hub, that can get propagated into your destination systems. And as you can imagine with that, you can have uh, automatic tag-based masking policies and other kinds of things set up. So you don't have to replicate all of that work multiple times. You just do that work once, wherever it makes sense. And the actual control plane essentially migrates it into wherever it needs to go. And then finally, we have the concept of data products, so that allows you to con combine all of these individual data assets and tier one assets into a unified data product that you can then have a conversation with your business stakeholders about. So when you write up your quarterly report and you're like, what did I produce this quarter? You can basically point them to the data product page and that includes all of this information in one go. But that's not all. That's just establishing context and creating what good looks like. On top of that, we have an observability module that gives you continuous insights into how things are changing over time. And that essentially becomes like a data quality control center. Uh, it allows you to see how uh, data sets are landing, what looks normal, what looks anomalous. And then on top of that, uh, it gives you a bird's eye view of all of your data assets uh, and the quality across all of them. But that's monitoring. How do you go from monitoring to actually creating data contracts? Um, that's where um, the next step of this journey goes. After you've observed and monitored and defined what normal looks like, the engine actually starts proposing data contracts. So that way a data producer doesn't have to write a data contract from scratch. They're actually automatically getting a suggestion that we think this data set usually lands by 7 a.m. on Fridays, and we think these are the characteristics of the columns, and we think uh, you should have this kind of schema assertions. And all you have to do is approve it. And once the data producer approves it, we automatically open up. And this is what it looks like for developers. Um, this is the YAML spec. It's an open source YAML um, spec that we've um, built as part of the Data Hub project. And it includes you know, schema assertions, freshness assertions, as well as data quality assertions. And those are all translatable to dbt concepts. So what we can do, basically, is with that generalized data contract that comes out of Data Hub, we can translate aspects of those into specific concepts within dbt. So for example, the schema assertions become a data contract in dbt. Uh, the freshness assertions actually become dbt tests. Uh, and the same for other kind of assertions. They just become dbt tests. So you don't have to go in and write dbt tests automatically. We can suggest those and propose those. And then you can, of course, edit them before accepting them. And that goes as a D GitHub PR. So the developer who's used to GitHub, they just stay there. And the business users who are used to working and deciding on things in the UI, they can just stay there. And that's a big piece of what we've wanted always, right? Business users, they don't want to get too technical, keep them in the spaces where they love being. And the folks that are in GitHub that are managing artifacts in a versioned way, let them do that where they're at. And so that's what the whole loop looks like, all the way from your dbt ecosystem, monitoring it, applying principles, policies, and then being able to reflect those back into the source systems so that there's never a walled garden and there's never a silo. Everything's like free flowing and going back into the source systems where they belong. So that's our vision for continuous governance. A lot of these features already exist in the product, so it'll be pretty cool to get your input and your feedback because we're building this as a collaborative standard with the rest of the community. Uh, our goal really is to allow everyone to maintain velocity, and sh but sh only ship governed product, and let's not ship low quality assets. Um, that's where we're headed. Uh, happy to take uh, questions or be here and chat afterwards. What's under the hood? Data Hub, I didn't talk too much about it. That's a whole other talk. It's an open source metadata platform used by thousands of companies. Came out of LinkedIn, that's where um, I built it. And uh, it enables data discovery, data observability, and federated governance. Uh, Acryl is the company that's advancing the Data Hub project. Miko is our fantastic community manager. Um, and um, 
you know, commercially, Data Hub is available as Acryl Cloud. So that's kind of the relationship between uh, the two uh, logos. And Data Hub is a very widely used uh, open source metadata platform. I keep meeting people who are using Data Hub, and I didn't even know them. So that's uh, pretty cool to watch. Um, that's it, and would love to take questions or talk. Thank you.